All right, good evening, everyone. And, uh, thanks for joining us uh, on uh, Marea's July presentation. Uh, tonight's presentation is on offshore wind, wind with uh, Doug Copeland. Um, coming up uh, next month, uh, August 31st, we have electric vehicle infrastructure. Um, Tom Bonner of Pico Electric will talk about the challenges of planning and installing electric charging infrastructure in southeastern Pennsylvania. Um, very important topic as we move to electric vehicles. Uh, we have to have the infrastructure in place uh, to, to really have widespread acceptance of electric vehicles. Um, and then on uh, September 28th, our topic is uh, digging deeply into geothermal for a more renewable future. Um, we're going to hear from Jefferson Tester, who's a Cornell professor of sustainable energy systems. And uh, he will talk about uh, Cornell's project to provide large scale geothermal heating, not only for Cornell University campus, but, but beyond that in uh, large scale applications. Uh, very interesting. And then on October 26, uh, we're looking for your input. Um, we're looking for your ideas and presentations on your sustainability projects or your questions on sustainability projects. Um, if you'd like to make a presentation, uh, let us know. If you'd like to make a presentation or prepare one, but you're too shy to present, that's fine. Uh, we'll present it for you. Uh, well, we'd love to hear from you. Um, email your ideas and thoughts uh, to uh, hello at the and of course, you'll see that on our regular emails as well. So thank you. And um, Chuck? Yes, good I'll evening. Good evening. It's my pleasure this evening to introduce our speaker, who uh, has been in my classroom a couple of times now and engaged uh, the younger generation in dialogue and sustainable energy solution space. So Doug has worked in the renewable energy sector for over 15 years leading development efforts in both onshore and offshore wind, solar, and energy storage. So he comes well equipped to talk about this latest activity that he has been engaged in, which is the first and largest um, renewable energy project in the state of New Jersey. I'm not going to steal his thunder. I'll let him tell you all about it. Um, Doug has uh, overseen the development and overall portfolio for this project with focus on pre-financial stage. He's led interconnection strategies, worked with the fishing crews in the Jersey area, industry engagement, oversees the real estate efforts associated with both on land and offshore, external affairs, government relations, and port strategies. So if you, if you can't get the message from that, that Doug's at the heart of this very large project, I don't know what else to say. He uh, serves on national offshore wind and energy industry boards and advisory committees in New York, New Jersey, and Maryland. Prior to his career in renewable energy, he ran a nationally recognized economic development program. He is one of our own. He has a bachelor's degree from Villanova University, which I've become quite fond of, and a master's degree from Boston College. Without further ado, Doug, the floor is yours, and we're really excited that you could share your time in your busy schedule with us this evening. Well, thank you very much. Um, you know, when you have someone read your bio, I, I don't know, I, I end up feeling like it's a little more bragging than it's supposed to be. There's a couple things that are more past tense. There's only so many hours in my day, but I do appreciate uh, the opportunity to uh, to present to you all tonight. Um, I am again. I'm Doug Copeland. I'm the development manager for Atlantic Shores Offshore Wind, and we recently won uh, the largest award ever given in the state of New Jersey, and actually the second largest of any offshore wind solicitation uh, here in North America. So uh, we're very proud of it. It's uh, it's a big step for us as a joint venture. It's uh, the largest award actually of either one of the parent companies of the joint venture. Uh, I have worked at EDF Renewables for uh, over 12 years and our other joint venture partner is Shell. And I'll talk a little bit about that, but uh, it was a huge step for all of us. So we're very excited. And so I'm gonna give a, a, an update on kind of where we are at Atlantic Shores and also just some other general offshore wind slides. Um, if any of you came to our open houses last week, you will notice a few slides that 
that were presented back there. They're good general slides to get everybody kind of on the same page for offshore wind. So um, with that, Chuck, should I just kind of share my screen and dive ahead? All right. So, uh, all right. Can everybody see my slide here? Not yet. How about that? And if I could ask the audience to mute their microphones. So, thank you. Wonderful. Um, so again, Atlantic Shores, let's see here if I can skip ahead to the next slide. Um, there we go. Is a joint venture between uh, Shell and the Shell's renewable energy arm called Shell Renewables and Energy Solutions um, with a lot of offshore experience in the oil and gas sector, but 15 years of experience in wind, um, including offshore wind in both uh, Europe and in the US. Um, EDF Renewables North America, which is the, the kind of the side of the family that I come from, uh, has the headquarters in San Diego and has been working in the, the US renewables industry since the mid 80s. Uh, and so we've got a pretty big footprint here across North America. And then our, our parent company back in France, EDF, has been doing offshore wind there since 2009. Um, Joint ventures are kind of an interesting melding of, of kind of companies and ours is I think going exceptionally well. Um, it is, I think the future of offshore wind is you're gonna see more and more of these joint ventures just because the costs are so high. So even two companies like Shell, which is one of the largest oil and gas players in the world and EDF, which is the largest utility in the world, still looking for a partner in kind of how we bring these projects forward. Just because your, pro your project costs are anywhere from, you know, a small project is gonna be $3 billion and a larger one is gonna be 10 or $12 billion. So we have control over a, a lease area off the coast of New Jersey. Um, the, all of the offshore areas off of the coast, so anything after three miles is considered federal waters and that's run through uh, a department inside of the Department of Interior called the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management or BOEM. Um, and they regulate offshore wind, they regulate oil and gas, they regulate uh, sand borrow areas, um, they regulate dumping grounds for kind of dredge spoils that are not contaminated. Um, and they, they're basically the landlord of the sea. And if anyone is familiar with the Bureau of Land Management onshore, that's their kind of analogous uh, kind of sister group. Um, so they have a number of these lease areas. We have one called OCS or Outer Continental Shelf 0499. Um, it's one of the larger offshore wind lease areas. And I've got a map on the next slide that shows all of them on the East Coast. Um, but we are about 183,000 acres. We're 10 to 20 miles off of, of New Jersey. So if, if you're familiar with the Jersey coast, we've got Atlantic City to our south and the top of Long Beach Island or Barnegat Light at the north side of our lease. Um, the coast here uh, off of New Jersey, especially for folks who have kind of been here, you know, and been out on a boat, you know that it's, it's a lot of sand and it's, it's pretty uniform in kind of how it slowly drops off until you get way up to the shelf. So it's really optimal as far as building conditions for offshore wind. Um, and our first project, which we recently were awarded uh, this, this 1,510 megawatt solicitation to the state of New Jersey, um, the first phase of it will start delivering power probably in 2027 is, uh, is what we have in our calendar right now. And again, I'll talk a little more about our schedule coming up. Whoops. So our focus right now is especially on New Jersey, but I wanna show this map just to show these are the other lease areas that are, that are off the coast. So you can see ours off of New Jersey. It's the, the northern of the two New Jersey leases. Um, there's actually a, another lease that's a little bit, two other leases that are a little further south that aren't shown on here, one off of Virginia and another off of North Carolina. But you can see that one off of Maryland that's been around for a while, there's a, a project that's actively developing there. Another one, same thing off of Delaware. The two in the middle of those areas, let's say Hudson South call area and Hudson North call area, those are actually right now undergoing a federal review process so that later this fall, um, there'll actually be an auction for those areas. So it'll be a competition amongst the de different developers who uh, either have leases or want to have leases to, to bid on those lease areas. Um, right now, there's a, there's a very clear set of processes uh, with the federal government. And of course, everything is an acronym. Uh, so right now you're in the PSN or the proposed sale notice phase for those lease areas. And so right now, the, if, you, if you actually you know, were to go to the, um, you can go to the Federal Register or to the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management's website, and you can see the proposed map of where they want to put the lease areas there and the whole process for how to comment on it. And so that process right now is, is open. So folks are submitting comments, whether they're developers in favor of it or folks who just have general questions, there might be folks with concerns. 
um, but all the sort of different stakeholders of which all of us are as, as taxpayers uh, are able to submit comments there. If you look a little bit further north off of the coast of New England, you've got a handful of lease areas up there, uh, including some of the, the ones that have some of the first projects uh, to be built, large projects. Um, so up there, you of course, there's the small block island project, which was the first one in the, the kind of steel in the water here. But then those, those other stripes all there are all part of the Massachusetts Rhode Island lease areas. And these are uh, in a very different set of ocean conditions than we have off of New Jersey. Uh, these are deeper, the soil is a little bit less uniform. Uh, you know, there's a difference between clay sand and sand clay, <laughs> and there's a lot of boulders up there. And so what you'll see is if, if you're interested in this industry and you're kind of following projects, different foundation designs, different kind of approaches for uh, some of the installation, all based on those subsea conditions. Um, but what's really cool for us working off the coast of New Jersey is the state has really taken a leadership role. Um, for anybody who's, again, pretty familiar with New Jersey, you can kind of see the Delaware Bay that's down here. I don't know if my cursor shows up on the screen. Um, but up here, you've got uh, the Salem County Nuclear Power Plant that's owned by Public Service Electric and Gas. Uh, and that next to it, there is going to be a large port called the New Jersey Wind Port that the state is taking the lead in developing. And so this combined with a couple other ports along the Delaware are really is how New Jersey is trying to leverage the opportunity to bring in the jobs uh, and the other economic development that's associated with offshore wind. And that's really what's driving a lot of these state policies. And so in fact, if we go to the next slide, these are the different state policies kind of along the East Coast for offshore wind. And so you can see their kind of overall commitment there in the middle, uh, how much they've awarded to date, and then uh, what's under solicitation right now. So uh, just in last month, New Jersey awarded uh, a, a very large solicitation of 2,600 megawatts. Um, ours was 1,500. And just to put that in a little bit of context, 1,500 megawatts is probably enough power for about 700,000 homes. So, uh, you know, New Jersey has a very high clean energy standard, as does New York. And you can see the other states along here. And the thing that, that is just so important to think about with all of these, these states is you have this pairing of federal policy, which has these lease areas that are required to actually build projects, but state policy that really drives the power contracts that are needed. And so as, as a developer, there's two parallel tracks that you're always working on. The one is trying to um, find a way to sell your power. And so these different states are running solicitations or RFPs, requests for proposal, um, and bids that are, you know, every couple of years, New Jersey has a very prescribed, it's every two years and then it's every 23 months. And they kind of have this through the end of the decade. Um, New York has not set an exact schedule, but that's about what they're working on. Maryland just has an open schedule. So if there's a project that wants to submit, they can submit a bid into the state. Um, Virginia has their own kind of process. So that's not really a bid schedule. Um, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Massachusetts have all at different times posted uh, these proposals. And each one of these states is looking for a large amount of offshore wind for um, multiple reasons. The first is that this is a, a really important way to get large scale renewables on the East Coast into load centers or into cities. So you think about the East Coast, you think about how far away power plants are that come into New York or Philadelphia or Boston, they're coming from very far away. I live in Philadelphia and we get a lot of power in our Pennsylvania, in this part of Pennsylvania, some local, but some is actually coming all the way from Ohio. And I grew up in New York and a lot of the power that comes to the Southern part of New York is coming from, from well upstate. And so the idea of an offshore wind project that's 10 or 20 or even 50 miles off the coast is really, you know, many, many ways actually closer than some of the existing power plants that are there. And so the states want large scale renewables. This is a great way to do it. Um, when they want solar, depending on the type of solar, they want renewables, but they also want jobs. And that's a huge part of offshore wind as well, but it's a different type of job than solar. These are a lot of manufacturing jobs, a lot of construction jobs, and, and that's a huge component for all this. So a state like New York, especially a state like New Jersey, um, Maryland to some extent as well, have really staked out saying they're, they want renewables, but they want to know the economic development opportunity. They're kind of leading with the jobs. They, of course, care about the price of it, and that's a huge part of the, the overall review. But the jobs component is a big one for them because they want to revitalize existing ports or build new ports or really just find ways to reinvent portions of their economy or, or really continue it in a way that um, brings new life to whether it be Atlantic City or uh, Paulsboro, which is just south of Camden in New Jersey, or the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal in New York, all of these different efforts by the states are designed to, to bring in 
you know, good paying, fair jobs. Uh, many of them are going to be union. And then the long-term operations and maintenance jobs that come with it. And then, of course, all the positive economic spillover that, that goes with it. And so when you look at a chart like this, I think what's really important to keep in mind is these states have these offshore wind goals because they have a strong focus on renewables. But those goals are simultaneous with a really strong job focus. Um, and so I just want to make sure that the folks are kind of thinking about that as, as we go through this, that it's, it's really got to meet two purposes. And that's why for our success in New Jersey recently, we have a tremendous amount of job creation that comes with our project. Um, for those of you who haven't had a chance to ever see an offshore wind project or um, you know, just sort of curious what they look like, I've got some pictures coming up that just sort of spells out, just to kind of, as we talk about an offshore wind project, kind of puts a little bit more in context for you. So the, the picture on the left and the one on the far right are from the, um, Actually, the one on the left is from the Blythe project, uh, which is a project off of the UK that EDF Renewables built. It was a, a five turbine demonstrator project using a unique foundation uh, that was a combination of a gravity based foundation and a monopile. Um, I'll show a picture of this on the next one so it'll <laughs> make a little more sense. Um, and that photo in the middle is actually a zoom in of that yellow portion, that transition piece. So it just gives you a sense of the scale of how big it is compared to people. Um, the one on the right is of the Teesside project. I've actually been to this project. It's off the coast of, uh, of Northeast England, a little town uh, up there called Hartlepool and, and Teesside. And they're all kind of just in this, this kind of small, formerly industrialized area that uh, has now seen a bit of an offshore wind boom. And so it's, it's been able to, uh, to really, uh, you know, kind of reinvigorate the economy up there. This is a, the one on, for Teesside is an interesting project. These are much smaller turbines. Uh, than the ones on the left. The ones on the left are, are some of the larger turbines. And the, the larger turbines now are getting to be more than kind of 10 or by the time our project comes online, probably a 15 megawatt turbine. And so that's just, that's massive. Uh, it's a tremendous amount of power. Um, and, and so this is where the industry is really going. And so that's where that, that middle picture there of the, the crew climbing the transition piece there, climbing up the ladder, just puts this in context. Uh, the tip of the blade for these projects now is going to be anywhere from 850 to 1,000 feet in the air as far as scale. So this is really what, <laughs> what we're talking about when we talk about a turbine. Is, uh, and this is one of the slides I stole from one of my colleagues who did the, uh, the open house last week. Is a wind turbine has a, a few different components. So uh, we'll start at the bottom. So you have the foundation. And so we have a number of different foundation types. So you have the, the simplest. Uh, which is called a monopile, which is basically a steel tube that is um, hammered into the seafloor. Um, with that hammering comes a lot of different sound protection equipment to make sure that you're not, uh, you know, really harassing wildlife or, or causing, you know, massive uh, sound to kind of cascade through the ocean. Um, there are other types of foundations called gravity-based foundations, which look like basically an upside-down mushroom that rest on the seafloor and then stick up. There are jacket foundations, which look more like a lattice tower that you would see uh, on an oil and gas type platform. The Block Island project uses uh, those types of foundations. There are other types of foundations called suction bucket foundations, which uh, they rest on the seafloor and then you suck air out of the, the buckets that are on the bottom of them and they just basically suction themselves to the seafloor. Um, a lot of different types of designs, but what they all do is they get to a point where there is a cylinder, they come up and they meet the tower. Um, in between the foundation and the tower is a transition piece. That was that yellow piece that was on the last photo that has uh, basically a ladder, the, 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 um, the interconnection, the wires that kind of come up, the cables come into that. Um, that's where you get into the top of the, the transition piece is where the door is to actually get to the tower. Uh, the tower itself goes up, you know, anywhere from probably, well, right now that the towers are, I, probably about uh, 200 meters tall at this point, maybe 175, depending on the turbine type. It gets up to the nacelle. The nacelle is the box at the top that has all of the guts. Um, an onshore turbine, just for kind of point of reference, that nacelle is probably the size of a city bus. An offshore uh, nacelle is, is multiples of that. Um, attached to that is the hub, which, which then the blades attach to. Um, and that's pretty much it. There's a few other kind of things that get attached. The nacelle has a place on the back that you could pick somebody up for an aerial rescue if you needed to. Um, there's a lot of equipment that's inside of it, but, but this is the sort of the general design that all wind turbines are, you're, you're going to see. And what's interesting is that these turbines are really, uh, they're pretty intelligent. <laughs> um, there's a lot of different sensors in there. And so the first thing that I, I, the first group I ever presented to when I, 
I, uh, you know, first started for this company here in Philadelphia was actually a group of third graders and my, my son was in the class. And so I had to find the right analogy for them to talk about wind turbines. And so when we talk about feathering the blades, the average, you know, nine, eight year old doesn't really know what that is. But I say, well, look, you've all stuck your hand out the window. And before your mom and dad, you know, roll the window up and say, get your hand back in the car, you take your hand and you can kind of put it flat. You can put it, you know, put it upwards. And that's feathering. That's how a prop works on an airplane. And what that's designed to do is to keep the wind turbine actually rotating at the same speed all the time, regardless of the wind, or at least inside of a pretty wide range of wind speeds. Uh, a wind turbine is like any other piece of equipment. And for, for those of you, I know at least Chuck will appreciate this. Uh, there was a show on, on NPR called Car Talk. It was on for many years and click and clack. They were brilliant guys. Um, they were talking about cars. And I still remember this one episode, this woman asked about a car that had been sitting in a garage for 40 years. And he said, well, look, cars want to do one of two things. They want to go at 60 miles an hour down the highway, or they want to sit in a garage for 40 years. And that's kind of the way machinery works, right? It wants to be either very consistently moving or very consistently not moving. The worst thing you can have is a lot of stops and starts and that kind of thing. And so wind turbines are made to turn into the wind, to adjust for the speed of the wind by making sure those blades feather so they really can capture as much wind as possible and operate at that very, you know, kind of similar and consistent uh, rounds per minute or RPM. So that's just, you know, there's a lot that goes into it. There's uh, temperature, barometric, wind speed, all sorts of monitoring equipment on here. Um, plus all these sensors that are there that report back to our operations maintenance base. So, um, you know, it's, it's like anything else, there's going to be a board with a whole lot of data that's on it. And if something's running a little hot, <laughs> We'll be able to know that and be able to send a crew out there and a lot of the work can be done remotely but then of course if you need to get out there we have vessels to do that so i just put this on here just to show kind of all the different things that are part of a wind turbine that it's it is a lot more than the tower that is on the blades there's all of these different components to it and then we talk about the actual wind farm itself what's a part of this so we have these turbines and they connect to an offshore substation. And an offshore substation is basically like a giant version of this, the panel you have most likely in your basement or perhaps on the first floor of your house, depending on where you live. Um, and so imagine the wind turbines like outlets in your kitchen. They're gonna be on different circuits and you might have five outlets on one circuit and another five in a different room on another one. And so all of these turbines are on a string. And so if you need to shut down a wind turbine, you shut down the string. You can shut down an individual one or you can shut down a string. So you might just be able to go to the substation and you can click off and knock 10 turbines offline for a little bit. So they all come to the substation and there the voltage is stepped up from a lower voltage, usually around 66 kilovolts up to probably about 230 or 275 kilovolts. And if you think of electricity like plumbing, you're basically just changing the dimension of the pipe to increase the water pressure. And so we send that power to shore and all these cables are buried. They're about six feet underground. Um, and the export cable that goes to shore, instead of kind of, you know, one single cable, which is what the inner array cables are, this is a three core cable. It's a big cable. It's about eight to 10 inches in diameter with three other cables inside of it and then the armor uh, plating around inside and then a big plastic coating and some other insulation. And so this gets buried and then we get about a quarter mile offshore and we actually um, have what's called a horizontal directional drill. So you have a, a pipe that is, that is basically shoved underground and then you pull the cable up through that to reach the shore. And once you're on shore, you run underground some a little bit further. Uh, for us, for our project, we'll probably go about 12 miles. That three core cable will split from three to three different small cables that will continue to this onshore substation. There the power is enabled to connect to the local power grid, goes to the utility, uh, and then continues on uh, into the overall transmission system. And so the POI you see there, that's the point of interconnection. That's the place where we actually connect to the power grid, uh, where the project electricity that's been generated at sea has now entered the transmission system of whichever state you're, you're putting it into. So that's a lot. Uh, <laughs> um, and so I just wanted to make sure, though, that, that folks had a, a good sense of kind of where where this all kind of fits in. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know, Chuck, if you ever wanted something sort of interesting for folks who want to geek out on the energy market, having somebody from PJM come and speak might be sort of interesting to understand how the electrons are designed to flow across Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland, and kind of this whole region. It's uh, it's kind of fascinating. We have an air traffic controller of the transmission system designed to keep our lights on and keep them from flickering. And they are actually this group, they're called PJM. 
that they're our local, what's called independent system operator. Um, there's multiples of them around the US and it's, uh, it's kind of fascinating what, what they do and how they do it. So I'm gonna pin it back to Atlantic Shores and talk about our project. So when we talk about our project, I mentioned earlier, we have this, these dual tracks of permitting and finding a power contract. So recently we're awarded this power contract we also were recently told that our construction and operations plan, or COP, is reached the stage where the, the federal government, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, will now start the public engagement process. So this begins in September. Um, and as part of this, um, you'll actually be able to go to our website and find out when these meetings are going to be. They're not hosted by us. They're hosted basically about us. <laughs> and so we as Atlantic Shores will be uh, as much of a participant as you would be um, in any of these meetings uh, because we have submitted this multi-part uh, application. It was about 4,000 pages. It included 35 different studies um, and it took a couple years to put together. Uh, that went in, that was submitted. Um, and with that, now comes the review process. And this is a multi-year process. And as part of this, the, the COP process, uh, our project along with any other wind project, there's a, it's called a dashboard that's there on the, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management's website. And it shows where these projects are in the permitting stage. So it's a very public kind of set of circumstances. There's a very you know, prescribed number of outreach meetings and opportunities for the general public to submit comments, uh, support, changes, frustrations, anything they want, just general questions all comes in. Um, right before that, we had uh, achieved actually our SAP approval. That's a site assessment plan. And, and on the next slide, I've got a picture of our buoy and actually put a buoy on the site you need to have a SAP. This is a, a, a shorter process, but is designed to allow the installation of some of the key data uh, sensors that we need on our site. And that's that, that other document there or other item there. Um, but all of this leads to our COP takes about two years to secure. And then we would start our onshore work. Um, and we say onshore construction in 2024. It's a little bit of a misnomer from the standpoint of our suppliers, the folks who we're going to be buying equipment from, will start their work actually immediately after our, our COP is approved. So that will probably be in 2023. And because they've got to build the factories that we're going to be buying equipment from and to start bringing all those materials together for all the different components that we're going to secure, as many of them as possible from New Jersey. Uh, and some of them will come from Europe. Uh, some of them may come from other states. But really, our focus for our first project especially is to localize as much, as a, as, as much of that as we can in New Jersey. But in 2024, we start our onshore construction. That's gonna be all of our underground cable systems. So we will dig up roads, we will put uh, concrete uh, you know, in the ground with pipes in it for the conduit so that when we want to come back and actually run the cable, it's a much simpler process. You're not tearing up the street. You just pull up with the truck with a giant cable spool, you feed it through, the crew comes after that, connects everything together, very simple. You know, a couple traffic cones, <laughs> a very different process than the actual installation of that onshore work, especially our onshore substations, which require, you know, significant grading and just overall kind of design and assembly work takes, it takes a while. In 2025, we will start our, sub, our offshore foundation construction. So that's the offshore construction. And so what we will do over the course of the first season is actually start installing the foundations across the entire lease area. After they go in, then we start putting in the turbines. Um, we're refining our schedules. We may do something where we do some turbines followed by some, or sorry, some foundations followed by some turbines. We may do all the foundations at once and then the, then the wind turbines themselves. This is all being kind of finalized right now, but we try to keep our options open because part of it is, is this overall design envelope and construction plan that we have. We're trying to maximize a number of different things. And so local content, number of, and that includes local vessels and there's certain requirements about vessels we can use from the US and ones from Europe that we can't use or can. And so all of that gets kind of factored in, but at the end of the day, we're shooting for the first phase of the project to reach operation in 2020. So we talked about our project, all of that schedule gets informed by a whole lot of work. And that's what I'm gonna talk about in these, these next handful of slides. And so that picture on the left is, is one of our buoys with the LIDAR system. LIDAR is a, shoots a laser up in the air and tells us the wind speed at different heights um, and is really can measuring all these different conditions out there. And actually on our website, we post the data from our buoys that are, that are out there. So if you're curious right now, you know, 15 miles off the coast of New Jersey, 
what's the wave height? What's the temperature? Uh, you can actually find that right there on our website. We, we post it. We also share a lot of this data publicly with some other sources that fishermen and other maritime users use. Um, but this, this really governs a lot of our kind of final design when we think about uh, our turbine selection and also just about how we, we really think about the long-term maintenance and kind of overall availability of the project. And we also have an onshore system. We're working with Rutgers um, in Tuckerton, um, which is a beautiful area. And this system, instead of, uh, you know, kind of shooting straight up, this one actually can shoot straight up or straight out. And so we're able to, to get onshore measurements and offshore measurements. The offshore measurements, of course, are where our project is. Um, but it is really important to kind of see how they match up with something here onshore that isn't moving around. Uh, and, and the buoy, of course, has software to compensate for all that. But it's really important to be able to have both sets of, of data as we look to, uh, to really verify what we're doing. The other thing that we really have to understand is the whole lease area. And that's the, the seafloor. And so this one here, I have a couple pictures about some of our different survey work. Um, just because it's, it's what we're doing right now, it's kind of fascinating. Um, and it really governs all of our foundation design. It also governs some of our cable installation. And it really gives us a sense of, of what's out there. Um, so we're doing this with a lot of different types of equipment. Some of the vessels are huge, like the one in the top right. We actually this year are using three smaller vessels that are based out of New Jersey um, to collect some data as well. And we're doing this both across the lease area, but also where our cables go. Uh, and so really just to understand everything that's out there in a way so that when we go to, to install the project and build it, um, we just really have a true understanding of the, the true conditions. So to do that, we've spent over $40 million. It's been a, a huge deal for us. Um, but like I said, 85 staff on these five vessels right now. Um, and, and for us, again, it's about localization. So having three out of New Jersey, the other two out of Elizabeth, New Jersey. Um, these are very large vessels. There's really not any other ports in New Jersey that could handle them. Um, and then eventually, you know, we've been able to use Atlantic City, which is really kind of cool for us. Um, and, and just a shout out to the, the ports in both Atlantic City and Elizabeth. We've done all this during COVID, um, which has made all of our lives challenging. But you can imagine these crews, like there's no social distancing when you're on a vessel for 10 days. Like, <laughs> and so to be able to, to meet our requirements so that our crews who come on the vessel healthy, stay healthy, even on resupply and all that kind of thing has been critical for us. And so it's been really important to have these, these local ports be such a, a good partner for us as we're doing it. And so the next slide shows a little bit more of the data from the standpoint of, of kind of what shows up on our screens. And so um, the one on the right is, is really, it's basically like an aerial view, but <laughs> it's underwater. Um, the one on the bottom left is a very detailed, this bathymetric uh, data that was collected here. If you look at kind of the broader blue part of this, that shows you like a regular fishing map. And then if you zoom in to those stripes we have, that shows you this very detailed contours that we have. And this becomes very important to us when we think about the foundation design, uh, because each one of the foundations is designed for the location it's put at. It's not that we just go and order 100 of the same foundation and just kind of call it a day. Um, every location has its own design. Um, and it just to account for all of these little micro variations that exist, and then we do core samples, and um, that's the one on the right. And um, I spent a lot of time thinking about food. I don't know why. It's just sort of how I'm, I mean, I'm having grown out of this from when I was a kid. So I think this picture on the right looks like a box of macaroons. Uh, you know, and, and so that's, that's kind of what I always think of when I look at this one. So New Jersey at different depths. And this, again, goes to when we design that foundation, we actually need to know what's going on 100 feet, 200 feet below the surface. Because once you install a turbine, it cannot tilt. <laughs> it has to be 100% pointing straight up in that 90 degree angle. And so that's where all of this comes in. Uh, the next slide that we really want to talk about is when we talk about our work, we definitely have to work with the fishing community. And so with this comes a, a number of things. So we have a fisheries communication plan. Um, this is something that I work on. Um, this is a, a document that's basically governs sort of how we interact with the fishing community. And we have two gentlemen who we work with uh, a lot on this. The guy on the top, is our fisheries liaison officer. He's from Barnegat Light. He's a, you know, 40 plus years of commercial fishing experience, a lot of research experience, a tremendous amount of just kind of on the water, sort of been there, done that, fished all sorts of different types of species. 
And we use him as he's really kind of our, our main interact interface with the commercial fishing industry and the surf clam industry, which is a subset of the commercial fishing industry. Uh, the other group that we work a lot with is the recreational fishing industry. And that's where uh, Captain Nowalski there on the, the bottom right comes in. Um, because the recreational fishing industry has probably more people than the commercial industry uh, because recreational fishing counts as, you know, somebody at the dock with a rod or somebody who's out on a, on a, what's called a party boat or a head boat with 100 people um, out at, you know, you know, 20, 30 miles off the coast and, and all of and any, everything else in between. And so our focus with the commercial fishing industry is, is really about uh, transit and where the turbines are going to go and how it might impact, especially the surf claim industry and our lease with recreation. It's, it's about transit, but it's also about uh, reefs and understanding, you know, how our project is going to be located around many of the other, there's diving areas off the coast of New Jersey that that mapping that we did, you know, kind of highlights those different areas where we need to stay away from. So it's really about working with these two uh, kind of, you know, key members of our team to gather that information and provide it back to us. Um, so I'm sure folks are gonna have lots of questions. It is a little bit uh, sort of odd presenting to a, you know, I can see a couple, a couple of course the host here, but uh, if, if folks have questions about any of this stuff we're done, I really look forward to answering it. I just have a few more slides. Um, when I talked earlier about the importance of jobs, I think this is something else that Atlantic Shores is really proud of. Uh, and, and again, if you came to our, our any of our open houses uh, last week, this was this was covered in one of them. Um, we have a, a memorandum, memorandum of understanding with uh, some key unions in New Jersey who would be part of our project. Um, and this was the first of its nation for a project to sign with the local units, not a national union agreement, but more of a local one. Um, and the other thing that I need to talk about now and definitely talk about in our next slide is when you think about this new industry, we need people. <laughs> And, and we can't rely on just the same group of, of folks from the same, you know, who've been parts of, of the construction industry or the utility industry to build this. We need to expand it. The pie has to be bigger. And so with that, we have a number of different initiatives. So one is to support Helmets to Hard Hats, which is a really cool program taking veterans and giving them an opportunity to move from working in the military to working in construction. And then we have a number of different initiatives that we've really focused on to really find as much local opportunity as possible. So um, we have worked with already with some of these local groups, uh, the Mud Girls and the Atlantic City Arts Foundation were part of our eco center, uh, which I'll show you a picture of at the end, which is our, our community center in Atlantic City. But we have an ongoing effort uh, that we're working on with the Boys and Girls Club. And if we think about that construction start date of 2025 and operations in 27, if you have a seventh grader right now or an eighth grader or a ninth grader who's interested in offshore wind and they're like that, I, I like working, you know, I like the water and I like working with my hands. 2027 is when we actually would need them <laughs> to be thinking about being a tower tech. And so, um, which is just crazy to think about, but, but that's, you know, kind of where we are. And so working with the Boys and Girls Club is not just a really cool thing to do to get kids excited about renewables and offshore wind. It's just, you know, kind of helping to, to find the next generation of, of employees for this. Um, plus also working with some other really cool programs. So this program at Roland College uh, is actually designed to bring more people of color and more women into the electricity industry, uh, energy industry in general. And so we're really proud to support this. Again, it goes to making the pie bigger. Um, and then, then again, it's this other kind of with the Rutgers Future Scholars Program, just again, finding these, these groups that are designed to get folks who have not typically been sort of aware or excited or interested in energy uh, very much, you know, kind of in the loop on what's going on. Um, and one of the cool things we did this past fall is we worked with a bunch of elementary schools in Ocean and Atlantic counties. And we, uh, we changed it from name our wind farm to name our wind turbines. And so we have two wind turbines that were named by a fourth grader in Ocean County and another fourth grader in Atlanta County. Um, I think one of them is the crazy wind turbine. Um, I can't remember what the other one is. Um, but it was, it was a blast to work with these kids. And so we did presentations for them. I was all over Zoom. And, uh, and gave them a chance to learn about offshore wind, ask us a lot of questions, um, just kind of a, a cool program that, that we've done that, you know, you take this work that we're doing with, with Rutgers at a couple different levels and Rowan and with, we have some work we're doing with Stockton and um, you take all these kind of work you're doing with, you know, 18 to 30 year olds and then you say, okay, now we're going to go talk to a bunch of nine year olds. It is a, a different experience, but also a, a really important one as we think about bringing this forward. Uh, my last couple of slides are just to talk about a few of the other things that we have going on. 
Um, as part of our project, we actually um, are doing we have some other innovation that's coming with it. And so one of those is a hydrogen project. So we're working with South Jersey Industries, which is a natural gas company in South New Jersey, Southern New Jersey. Um, and we're actually setting up an electrolyzer with that will take hydrogen and put it into the, uh, the gas pipeline. So SJI's system has a lot of plastic uh, pipelines as opposed to metal and hydrogen can kind of do bad things as far as corrosion. Um, and so their system is actually really well suited to, to put this hydrogen into the natural gas pipeline. So it displaces some natural gas. Um, and, and so hydrogen has an interesting kind of place in the sort of the fuel of, of the future, as some folks think of it, or just in the future with renewables, as well as a hydrogen uh, storage source. So you could store it and then, you know, kind of burn it or run it through, uh, you know, some, some way to basically create electricity from it. Or in our case, we're actually using it to displace natural gas um, and working with a natural gas company to do so. So very excited to work with them on this project. Um, and I think my, my last kind of real slide is really our, our eco center. It's not this whole building on the right. <laughs> um, it's actually, uh, if you can see my cursor, this place, this, this first floor section over here on, on what would be the, the left side of the building. This is right on the Stockton campus uh, in Atlantic City, right on the boardwalk. Um, and, and really designed the eco is the education and community outreach center designed to serve as a place where we can host kind of small and large gatherings. We have some uh, some displays that are coming in that are coming from Europe that are you know, kind of hands-on about how to build a wind farm. So it's, it's kind of like those ones you might see at a science museum if you've been to the Franklin Institute here in Philadelphia or, uh, you know, one of those things where you can, you can go on and you can figure out where all those components that I showed you early on, the turbines, the cables, the substation, all that kind of works and, and kind of fits together. Um, and we'll also be, be there just for, you know, some of our staff will be working down there sometimes. And this rendering here is actually pretty spot on. <laughs> uh, we had an event there a couple months ago, and it, it pretty much looks like that. Um, this, is, this is a really cool opportunity for us. We wanted to make sure that whatever we set up in Atlantic City was more than just, you know, kind of a glass door with our logo on it and a couple workstations. That this is really designed to be a very functional space that we can, we can host events at and, and at other gatherings. So that's that's a whole lot of real estate that I covered. Uh, a lot of a lot of waterfront there on offshore wind in general, Atlantic shores in general. And so I think uh, Chuck, if it's good with you, I can stop sharing and, and happily take questions from uh, many of your members. Wonderful, thank you, Doug. I have I have uh, about six questions in the chat, but I have two that are kind of universal. What's the size of this project? How many turbines? And how are we dealing with the birds and other environmental uh, flight paths or sea paths? Sure. So our first project um, will be up to 111 turbines. Um, if we go with a larger turbine, it will be slightly smaller. We, we want it with a 13.6 megawatt machine. And, and so if you do 13.6 times 111, you get, I believe it's actually... Uh, 1,509.6, but <laughs> we're saying 1,510 for, for that. Um, so that's where our, our first project would be, like I said, up to 111. Could be, could be less uh, depending on the turbine, uh, the turbine type. And on the bird side, there's actually a, a couple of really cool things we've done. So I mentioned earlier, we've done uh, 35 different surveys to date. Um, some of those are about birds, including um, tagging red knots. So red knots are a very important species that, that migrates up and down the East Coast, actually goes from, I believe, Canada down to South America, and they stop over in, especially in Cape May, uh, and they eat the eggs from horseshoe crabs. And well, they're very tiny birds, uh, which is just crazy to imagine they fly so many thousands of miles, but um, their flight patterns are mostly understood, but we wanted to really be clear about this for exactly this, this kind of question here. So we're actually, we, we, we did two seasons of tagging the red knots. So as they were migrating through, um, we had a, a red knot scientist who, who uh, we worked with, um, and then one of our teams, actually uh, our permitting manager, actually worked for the Fish and Wildlife Service for 20 years and led the listing of the red knots. So he knows his, his birds. Um, and so we tagged these red knots with little micro transmitters and sent them off flying. And it gave us a really good sense of how quickly they get up to the height. So red knots fly very high, like 5,000 feet, um, and they get there really fast. They, they don't have sort of a gentle glide path. They kind of just rock it up and then get to the height they need to and continue on. Um, and then the other species of birds that are along the coast 
for the most part, don't really end up out in our lease area. Um, that said, we continue to monitor it and, and really, you know, our lease and the one to the south of it, a lot of different studies of the birds to make sure we don't have, uh, you know, kind of any, but we make sure we have a true understanding, which again, kind of, I think for the most part confirms that our impact is, is really not, not going to be something that, that impacts them in a, in a way that uh, is, is really detrimental. Okay. Um, so there's lots of questions here. Uh, Joe, do you want to take the next one or? Sure. Um, you talked about feathering with respect to the blades. Do the blades tilt to capture the wind? They do. So, um, so first the whole head of it, the whole nacelle turns to face into the wind and then the blades turn so that the faster the wind, the, you know, the kind of the more horizontal the blade is. So um, the more extreme would be if you had a big storm, you would actually turn the turbine into it. You would flatten the blades and you would shut it down. You'd lock it up. Um, but during just regular wind conditions, they, they turn into the wind and they feather. So when the wind gets uh, slow, the blade is turning more vertical. Um, but well, when it's fast, it's, it's more horizontal. So the next Long, question. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say a follow-up question to that. Um, what is the wind speed typically that the blades would, the turbines would shut down? Um, it's going to be well over 55 or 60 miles an hour. Um, I can't recall. And, and part of it is I started in the onshore industry and the, the turbines would shut down at different speeds based on the different turbine manufacturers. Um, and these offshore turbines are designed to handle a very different set of conditions and the technology continues to refine so that there's actually a testing center in Boston and another one down at Clemson that actually look at sort of how much stress blades can take. And so um, it's gonna be fast, <laughs> uh, over 50 miles an hour, but I, I don't know the exact number um, because in some cases we, we haven't gotten actually that final answer from the manufacturers themselves. So the, the next question actually comes from one of my students, and um, he's heard you talk before, but he's specifically interested in about the impact of climate change and warming waters on your turbines. Sure. So um, it's interesting that you, you added the, the warming waters, right, because part of the, the reason that offshore wind is such an attractive energy source is that because of the difference in air temperature and water temperature, um, we get the turbine spinning at times of, of high power demand. So normally kind of late afternoon, which matches up well with, like I said, kind of the, the peak demand for the onshore system, you get a lot of offshore wind production. And so um, as ocean temperatures change, it can be, in, you know, can impact wind speed. So we're actually doing a study with Rutgers right now. This is actually, I think there's another question that who was in there about fishermen, um, where we are looking at, excuse me, at a, you know, what's going on for the next 50 years for the projected ocean temperatures and what will that mean? Um, and that makes a big impact on certain types of fishing, especially on surf ramps, but it also can impact us. Um, when we look at the wind data that we have collected on site, we've also paired that with decades of onshore wind data. And we, we really just look at how do they match up and try to see if there's been consistency or big changes. And so for the life of the project, we're not expecting to see some sort of wild swing where, you know, in year 17, all of a sudden the wind is going to stop or it's going to triple or anything like that. Um, these changes that, that may occur are not the kind of thing that occur necessarily that quickly from a wind speed perspective, but this is all part of that continuous monitoring that goes on and really around the optimization of the operations of the project. Um, and with that, if we do have extreme weather, the turbines are designed to handle the types of hurricanes that have rolled through the East Coast. So the next, the next question relates to um, the, the breakdown in economics between the cost of materials and the cost of labor. And That's a really good question. I don't cost. know the exact ratio for it. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, shoot, I don't know. I mean, so, so I can tell you that like our project that we won, uh, if you look at kind of rough industry numbers, you're, you're probably in the, you know, the eight to nine billion dollar range to, to build it. Um, a tremendous amount of that is coming from the actual equipment itself and, uh, and just the cost of installation as far as the actual equipment. But there are tens of thousands of jobs that are part of the manufacturing and construction project, but I don't have the exact number off the top of my head. Yeah. Um, if I could just chime in, I think from the open houses, I heard that 25,000 jobs are possible yep. in the Jersey area from this project alone. Yes. Uh, it's pretty exciting. We think so too. Uh, 
Joe, you want to take the next one? Sure. Two questions. Uh, where does the power come ashore specifically, and what do fishermen think about this project? So uh, the first one is pretty straightforward. Our first project, we're going to come ashore in Atlantic City and connect to a substation in Atlantic County, New Jersey, uh, with everything buried underground. Um, and then the fishermen, this is, a, this is an interesting question. This is one that I, I spent a lot of my days working on. And I think that there's a combination of, of, of kind of feelings, right? So our lease area does not have one type of fishing across the lease area. It's got multiple types of fishing. And so some fishermen just don't care because they're not in our lease area. Some are concerned about transiting through. Um, they don't fish in our lease area, but they wanna make sure they understand how the lighting and marking is and how the rows are going to be set up so that they can get through as safely as possible. Um, the fishermen who are going to fish in our lease area, and again, for us, that's a lot of surf clam industry and then some recreational industry, um, there's definitely some concern. And this is why we work with them to, to really collect this data. This big study we're doing with Rutgers is really designed with the surf clam industry. They were very much part of designing it and are a partner in it to understand what the potential kind of surf clam resource will be in our lease area. Because the surf clam resource has shifted uh, over the last decades, the last three or four decades. Um, it used to be much closer to shore. Now it's further out. Surf clams are very sensitive to ocean temperature. And as temperatures have, have risen, the surf clam resource has moved to cooler waters uh, to basically so that they can continue to grow and survive. Um, so we're working with them. And I mean, sure, if you would ask a surf clammer, like if, if you were not worrying about offshore wind, would, you, would it make your life less stressful? Uh, they would say, sure. But, but at the same time, they're also worried about a number of other things out there as well, between regulations and climate change and just kind of other sea conditions. Um, and then you've got the rest of the commercial fleet. And for us in New Jersey, a lot of the commercial fleet is scout fishermen who are looking a little bit further out. And, and some of their concerns are with uh, the New York bite lease areas. Um, but the thing with, with all of this, and, and the reason some fishermen are sort of less concerned than others, is that you can fish inside of our lease area. It will be different with different types of gear. Um, it's going to be, you know, harder to do kind of long trawling surveys or uh, trawling, you know, kind of fishing, but that doesn't really happen in, in our lease area off of New Jersey. Um, and, and in some of the other lease areas, there's, you know, it's, it's just a different setup. And so they design their projects a little differently. So I'd say by and large, the fishing community is definitely engaged. Uh, some are very concerned, some are against it, um, but there are some who are for it and they think that this is a good opportunity um, both because they they can fish in it and because there's there's other things going on out there and that this is a way to fight climate change. And so they they might you know, sort of grit their teeth but say, well, you know what? Climate change has really changed this fishery. It's changing what I'm doing and we have to do something. And so offshore wind is a, is a big something we can do to, to, to try to mitigate the impacts and, and reverse it as best we can. Thank you. So the next, the next question is, is a bit technical, but it talks about essentially the difference between generating hydrogen, which then would be used to make electricity, is inefficient compared to just using the electricity directly. So yep. Comment on the difference and uh, tell us uh, how you're achieving, what you're hoping to achieve in that part of the work. So a lot of the, the work of any of, of these kind of innovation projects that, that we're looking at and hydrogen being the, the, the kind of the, the big one that has gotten some headlines, at least in New Jersey, is to, is to try it out, is to figure out how, how efficient is it? What does it mean? And so if we, you know, if we spend X number of megawatt hours of electricity to put into this, how many kilograms of hydrogen is produced? And is that, is that a fair trade-off? You know, is, is, that a, is that a good amount or is there something else? And that's where so many of these kind of opportunities you see with hydrogen now are really about, it's, it's more than R&D because we know how to make hydrogen through electrolysis, but it's about the equipment and it's about how best to deploy it. And I think that that's where a lot of the discussion is, is, is really about, you know, how do we make hydrogen a, a more appropriate fuel to use? Um, and, uh, and, and you don't do that by starting with the sort of the largest project you can. You start with these kind of smaller ones, you take what you can and you learn. And, and for South Jersey Industries and us, it's like, okay, we're putting this into a gas pipeline. How does the pipeline react? How do customers react? You know, are they seeing any, any kind of change in their overall, uh, you know, kind of uh, deliverability and, and kind of use for folks? And, and so that helps them figure out, 
okay, maybe it's more than 10% we can put in here. Maybe we can go to 15%. Of course, they can't go to, you know, a, a full 100%. The equipment that they're selling the natural gas to isn't designed for that. But it's all about kind of figuring these different ways out how to use hydrogen. And so um, there's definitely, you know, kind of uh, going to be lost. There is with all generation types. Um, but there is also a huge benefit that comes with that. When you make hydrogen, you're just making hydrogen and oxygen. So it's, it's one of these things that, um, the byproducts are are pretty harmless, and so maybe you have some inefficiency in the creation, but your externalities are vastly different than if you were trying to use a different source of, of fuel. So um, it's definitely not something that we could say here in 2021 is the silver bullet will solve all our problems, but that's why for us we're considering a, an innovation project and one that we're, we're starting with at this stage. Thank you. Joe, you get the next one? Sure. Uh, a couple of components to this question. Where are the components of the wind turbines manufactured? Uh, also, what is the length of a turbine fin and how tall does it stand above the water? Sure, so the turbine blade is gonna be roughly 300 feet long um, and the tip of it uh, would be at anywhere from 850 to 1000 feet. And then in the bottom of the blade, if it was above the water would probably be around 75 feet off the water. Um, and these components are gonna come from a couple of places. Some is going to come from Europe. There's no kind of getting around that. Uh, this is this industry has begun. We have seven turbines here in the U.S. So it's it, you, you're not going to have a case where you can make everything here. Um, but that's where again we're trying to maximize our, our our U.S. opportunities and for us in New Jersey. So foundations we expect to come from New Jersey. Uh, the transition pieces we might um, start the manufacturing in one place and then finish the manufacturing in New Jersey. The towers we're looking at how we can have those come from the U.S. Uh, for multiple of reasons, um, but most it, it's just closer <laughs> and a lot easier than kind of transporting them across across the, the entire Atlantic. The blades will most likely come from Europe and the nacelles we may have come partially from Europe and then finish up the assembly here in the US. And so, and the components for these things are coming globally, um, but the blades themselves uh, require, you know, very specific facilities for, and so, you know, at some point, we really do hope as an industry, we're able to have all of these components from here in the U.S., but at least for these initial projects, you're going to see a mix of both, for the most part, Europe and the U.S., with perhaps some of the steel coming from, from Southeast Asia. Thank you. So I'm ready, to, I'm ready to learn something here, Doug. I've learned a lot from you, but I've never heard of the Jones Act. Ah, uh, the Jones Act. So How does that impact your construction plans? So... One of the things about being a developer and doing these kind of things is that the number of random things that I need to be able to speak with semi-intelligently, sort of like, it's just sort of funny to me. It's, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's the equivalent of basically like when you talk to like a five-year-old who loves dinosaurs and they know more than you ever imagined. Like, that's what I sort of feel like, like, you know, if I was to look at myself, you know, at some, when I was a kid and be like, why, why do you know about that? <laughs> this is what I do. So the Jones Act, for those of you who are not familiar with maritime law, um, or our pirate lawyers, as we like to joke, um, basically says that a foreign flag vessel cannot transport goods from one U.S. port to another. They can bring goods to that U.S. port from a foreign uh, you know, location. They can bring goods from that port to a foreign location, but they can't, you can't have a, a foreign flag vessel go from, say, New York to Philadelphia uh, transporting equipment. And so what this means is that uh, a wind turbine would count as a good, and when you put a foundation out, that counts as a port. And so the idea of transporting a foundation uh, or building a foundation and then bringing a vessel to shore that's a, a foreign flag vessel, picking up the wind turbines, bringing them out and installing them on the foundation would be a violation of the Jones Act. And so what we've done here in the US is uh, for those seven turbines, um, the sort of scientific term I think is actually bubble gum and duct tape, but you know, we found ways to make it work for that with feeder barges, which basically bring the equipment out to uh, to these vessels from Europe that are able to install the wind turbines. What we're looking at is this industry grows. So the first project that's really going to start construction is one off of Massachusetts called Vineyard Wind. And that'll be a, an 800 megawatt project. Uh, it's, it's, you know, like I said, the first one that's really of, of scale. And, and then you also see the project off of Virginia uh, that's going to be a, it's going to be two gigawatts. And both of those have different solutions, uh, basically ways they've gotten around the Jones Act or, or dealt with it. The one in Virginia, they're actually building their own installation vessel. It's a big enough project that they can, they can do that and basically cash flow it into the project. Vineyard Wind is looking at some other solutions. For us, 
this is all part of the work that our technical team is doing. And so what this might mean is we have a, a European vessel that again is part of the, the actual installation of the turbines, but we have uh, dedicated barges that are from the state or from nearby that can bring that can go out there. But those barges are designed to to do more than just kind of float next to that that uh, that installation vessel. Some of them are designed to actually kind of sit inside of them, and then they they all lift up. Um, there's other types of installations where we actually there's a scenario you actually build the wind turbine at the dock. This is re the reason that we're super excited about the New Jersey wind port. Uh, because there's no, there's nothing between it and the open ocean as far as bridges or power lines. If you've been up the Delaware or over the Delaware, you know there's a number of bridges. There's a, a large power line that runs from the um, from New Jersey to, to Delaware, just a little bit south of the Commodore Berry Bridge. And so, with all that, there's actually some vessels where you you build the whole wind turbine uh, or most of it right there at the quayside and bring out the wind turbine, and then it's then it's it's still installed with a different vessel out there, but you're able to minimize the amount of what's called marine lifts or, or offshore wind construction um, because it's much safer to do it on a place where the ground isn't moving. Um, and so there's a couple different ways we're getting, we're going to be working inside of the Jones Act. Um, it most assuredly impacts our construction plans. There's no getting around it. Um, and there's not a, an attitude from, from, the, the, from Congress, which is the group that would need to actually give a waiver for it, with the exception of vessels that just don't exist anywhere here in the US. Uh, and that would be like a, some of the cable installation vessels that they're, they're just very specialized and we don't have anything like this here. But the Jones Act was, was originally designed to basically prevent, uh, well, it was really designed to sort of increase the, the US shipping industry's power here in the US to allow for more ship construction. And so now that offshore wind is really at a place where um, it's growing as, as much as it is, I think you're gonna see more US flag vessels built with a couple different types of solutions going forward. Great, thank you. Are there any potential roadblocks to the project becoming operational in 2027? Sure, uh, you know, we're in a permitting process. Uh, it's, it's a process, it, it requires public engagement, it requires agency review um, up and down the, the federal government. And so as part of that, we could run into a delay um, we could have a delay in one of our key ports that we're using. So, so you know, if, if the port isn't available for us when we need it for manufacturing or, con you know, installation, um, that could impact us. Uh, we could run into weather delays. We could run into delays with the onshore electrical grid. Um, so there's lots of different delays that are there, uh, things that could slow us down. Um, but that's, that's all part of kind of our work as a, as a diligent developer to account for those kind of risks in our schedule and to mitigate them and have, you know, multiple backup plans. Um, but yes, I mean, there's, there's no sure thing. That's a lot of years out there, um, but that's why all that work that we're doing, all those studies that we're doing, all of the public engagement is going on now so that the further along we go, the more certain we can feel about our schedule. We have another question here about the hydrogen electrolysis. And the question is related to if you have sufficient electrical power, if your capacity is exceeding your demand, is, is this a reason for making hydrogen? So um, our project itself is actually not hooked up directly to the electrolyzer project. They're two very distinct projects, um, but our, by, by having this bigger offshore wind project, we're able to enable this other innovation project so that perhaps in the future we'd be able to connect to it. But this is, I think, a bigger discussion about the times of day, um, maybe not in New Jersey, maybe not in, in other places in the Mid-Atlantic, where you have more renewable generation than you would demand. Can you create hydrogen and store it? And the answer is yes. Uh, the issue is that nobody's done it yet, um, you know, here on the East Coast, but there's definitely, you know, some European projects that are looking at this. And that's actually why you see a number of these different projects going forward is to figure out what is the best way to, to really kind of handle those types of situations, which are unlikely to occur anytime soon. But I don't know if anybody remembers that slide early on where I showed those goals for the different states. And so if a state has a 100% renewable energy goal by 2050, which is what New York does and, and or New Jersey does, and I think New York is either 100 or 80%, um, you could find times where you need to store that. And so whether it's hydrogen or battery power, there's, you know, no matter how much solar you have, it's not gonna do you too much good at midnight unless you're able to have generated enough during the day to charge up batteries. And so 
Um, that's actually been going on in California with, with a very high degree of success. And I think you'll start to see more and more of that as these East Coast states start to see a lot higher renewable energy penetration into their overall power system. Okay, what is another question? What is the expected lifetime of the components? And a subsequent question is um, what type of problems or maintenance issues does seawater present, salt water? So um, there was a guy who, who used to be the, the number two guy in our company and he was, he'd been around long enough that he could just sort of say what he wanted. And so I, I won't say it exactly how he said it, but he said, you know, that. The ocean just beats the crap out of things, right? But he didn't say quite like that. Um, so it's a fair question about seawater. And so that's where that yellow paint that was on uh, the transition pieces on the turbines, um, one, it's a very specific yellow that is uh, mandated for offshore safety uh, from the Coast Guard, but it also is a, a very specific kind of paint as far as uh, corrosion resistance. And, uh, and so whatever is in the water has uh, a lot of coatings on it to prevent rust um, the blades themselves are fiberglass and carbon fiber, so the biggest opportunities for sort of damage from them are more just kind of general exposure to kind of air and just, they're not getting wet per se outside of rain, but you still have to monitor them and maintain them. But the biggest thing um, is the nacelle is negative pressure. So it's basically uh, like the White House. Uh, it, 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 you know, it, it sucks outside air in and then blows it out. And, it, and so as it comes in, it is dehumidified and it's purified. So that, um, yeah, if anybody's ever had a bike down at the beach that they left there for more than a half a day, bad things start to happen to it. Well, the same thing would happen to our wind turbines. And so we don't want that to happen. So there's a tremendous amount of basically control in the overall system to keep all of these electronics and the other pieces uh, from, from rusting. And that all leads to the lifespan, which our power contract is for 20 years uh, from the state of New Jersey. But we expect the project to be operate, operational for 25 to 30 years. And then at the end of that, um, we're actually required to remove everything uh, from, from the lease area as per our, our federal approvals. Um, but, but the foundations themselves can probably last longer. They're, they're made a little differently than the turbines themselves. But, uh, but the, the turbine lifespan, like I said, 25 to 30 years is, is a good marker uh, as far as the kind of a good rule of thumb. Then you could repower them, right? Potentially, yes. Yeah. So the next question is, is there consideration to use the former Gamasia site at Fairless Hills. So, so when I first got into the wind industry, I worked at Gamasia for three years, including uh, I started in the Midwest office, and then I was here in Philadelphia for a year and a half before I came to EDF Renewables and actually went to, to that facility. Um, and what's really funny is they named the road into it after the attorney. Uh, <laughs> it, was, it was so helpful. They, they did. But um, I think this site has actually uh, been redeveloped or is up for redevelopment. And so the answer is, is not at this time. Um, and I, I'm not really sure I see an opportunity for that. Um, that overall facility was uh, actually used by Gamesa for building the cells and uh, repairing towers. It was not designed for blades. So uh, their blade facility was actually in Western Pennsylvania, um, where I, I worked on some projects actually near Altoona, Johnstown area. Um, so the Gamesa site, is, is an interesting one. The other thing to, to keep in mind is that's on the Pennsylvania side of the Delaware River. And I was talking about all that economic development. Each one of these states wants to see it inside of their borders. And so uh, you can imagine a scenario where if you could build an offshore wind vessel in the Philadelphia Navy Yard, um, how would New Jersey you know, account for sort of that economic benefit, right? You'd have to figure out something to, to get some you know, kind of agreement in place so that you could uh, you know, say, okay, we're going to have this many New Jersey workers or something like that. So you have these kind of funny things where, you know, is it going to get you the job numbers that you need to see for those states? But the other is, I think the biggest one for that site is I, I believe there's actually some other redevelopment that's either gone on or planned for it. But uh, so it's a great question. And I hadn't thought about that site in a while, but uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty interesting. So that is all the um, questions that we have in the chat. Is there anybody in the audience that would like to unmute and ask a question verbally? I guess not. So Doug, before you, before you say goodbye, maybe you could just, I did attend the open houses. I went to all the verbal um, breakout rooms. And the one that I really found really exciting is what your company is doing to protect the whales. 
Could you could you comment about that in in light of the construction and and the fabrication? Sure. Joel so being... so for folks who who you know have, if you if you've been to the Jersey Shore or along the East Coast, there's there's a number of of marine mammals that that migrate up and down the East Coast. One of them is called the right whale. Um, and it's called the right whale because when they were hunting whales, it was the right one to fish for because it had a lot of blubber. Um, and, and so because of that, there's actually only about 360 or 370 of them left um, at all. And, and, a, and a very few per, number of them are actually, you know, kind of of age females to, to breed. And so uh, the protection of these whales is critical to our industry. Um, and, and it's also something that's very much, you know, part of the fishing and, and, and overall, uh, you know, just kind of vessel and, and, and boat industry in general. And so for us, um, we have very stringent requirements that are in place to, to protect them. So the first is in our construction, we have to do something called either bubble curtains, which, uh, which help to really mitigate the sound of putting in one of those monopiles um, or a different foundation technique that would be much quieter, but whatever it is, it has to be, you know, reduce the noise of, of whatever construction we're doing. Plus, we have to have marine mammal observers on our vessels um, and other ways of basically detecting these, these whales if they're anywhere near our lease area. Plus, we have very clear times of year that we can and can't build, uh, assuming those, those, you know, kind of impacts for sound. And so if, if we did have some sort of scenario where we had a, a very quiet foundation installation, we could potentially install that during certain times of year that we might not otherwise. But for the most part, we have these, these bookends on when we can build to not be out there when the whales are migrating through. Um, the other thing that we have to do is all of our vessels have very strict speed controls. Um, and we're expected to follow these, we're monitored for it. And it's something that you know, is, is on us. Um, and, and it's actually on many different types of vessels, but um, there's actually an article recently about how uh, some of the larger transit vessels are, you know, transportation vessels not following this rule. Um, and what can happen is that if, if, you, if you get above it and you hit a whale, you can cause a fatality. And so for us, for our vessels that will be transiting through, we will be operating at these low speeds so that um, one, if our crew sees a whale, we'll be able to turn quickly or two, you know, worst case, if we ever were to interact with one, it would not be at a speed that would cause a fatality. So there's both these kind of study work we're doing, uh, the construction techniques, and then the operational requirements and, and that are on us as we, uh, as we go forward to protect them. Okay. We did get a, one more question here, Doug. So we'll end with this one. The project's quite long relative to the 100% renewable goals for the state. What gigawatt value from offshore wind is possible to develop prior to 2050? I think this is beyond your project, but just all the projects. Yep. So um, I think that the East Coast right now has got 30 gigawatts worth of, of proposed, uh, of, you know, offtake agreements that are either um, granted or state solicitations that will be there in the future. And so I'd say at least 30 gigawatts, um, because what's going to happen is that our project timeline for our second and third and fourth project will move at a slightly different pace. It will probably move faster than our first projects because all of that work that we're doing right now, all of that study, we're doing across our whole lease area. And any of the other leaseholders are doing the same thing. They're not just looking at where that one project is, they're studying their entire lease area. And so their permits might still take time, but they're not going to have to start at zero for their study work. And so I think a good sort of rough number would be 30 gigawatts, but it could probably well exceed that because each one of these states has these solicitation goals that they want all of this by the end of the decade. And so if you figured another maybe five years after that last award, you could probably hit that 30 gigawatt target, you know, sometime in the mid to late 2030s. And so um, even though it does seem kind of far out, it's actually, it's sort of like a locomotive. You know, we might be starting slow, but once we get speed, it's really just going to be kind of chugging along the tracks and, and kind of being able to move in a, a much more kind of consistent pace going forward. Well, thank you very much. Really, thank you for your time, Doug. I know you're a very busy guy. Um, I, we, we've all enjoyed this very much. Um, My pleasure. It was uh, it was great to great to chat with anybody and for everybody. And and actually, if you are curious, if you didn't go to the open house and you wanted to see some of the other panels, um, there they will be. If they're not available now, they will be next week on our website. Um, 
And, uh, and so like I'm, I'm on the one speaking about fishing and navigation. There's one all about the environmental studies. There's one about visual. Uh, there's one about just kind of general project design. There's one about ports and job creation. Um, there's some other one pagers on different aspects of the project. So a lot of information will be there and you're welcome to, to take a look. Um, just gives you a good sense of both our project, but just the industry overall. And so um, hopefully if, if you're looking for a resource, that one uh, will we'll do it for you. Thanks again, Doug. Thank you, Doug. Good evening, no everyone. Thank you for joining us. Come back in August to hear about EV infrastructure.